dead. I know you didn't do anything like that to me, but I just wanted to say it. I was already strong, and I was a good mom. I was looking for somebody, and I was going to show you a lot of things. I should have been alone on a new flight all day. I was the one who was sick. I really should have told you that. I was so stupid. I was the one who was straight away. I thought I did it when I was a kid. I wasn't really scared. I was, I was just a kid. It was so beautiful that I could get a little over it, and I still felt like I was so lucky. I was starting to convince myself that I was a kid on the floor. I saw him die in the back of the line with a small boy who gave me a person. Hello. Hi, Sophia Fredericks, everyone. Sophia Fredericks. Why are we clapping? What the hell was that? Yeah, good, you're right. That was quite weird. Uh, and uh, we will give you an explanation of what that quite weird thing was in a little while. Uh, but uh, first of all, I'm Oscar Sharp. I'm a filmmaker. Uh, I'm Ross Goodwin. I'm a creative technologist. And uh, yeah, before we explain that thing to you, we're going to show you something else quite weird, which is a movie that we made. Um, so we'll roll these here, and we'll be back very shortly. Thank you. So that was our film. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll get to the explanation, I, I promise you, of what Sophia was doing uh, at the start very soon. Um, but yeah, we put this up online, and it, uh, it got quite a lot of hits. If not, yeah. It wasn't huge viral, but it's sort of about a million or so across a, a few versions. The main thing was the press response. It was crazy. We had um, uh, some, something like 100 really long blog articles and press articles. We, had, we were talking to French TV this morning on Skype, and it's, that was it's three months ago that we did this. So something, we struck some kind of chord, and that was weird. And what they all ask to begin with is, how did you guys decide to do this? Like, wh how did you get into it? Right. Um, and we both had very different uh, trajectories coming in. Um, for me, I was a, a theatre director in London um, uh, many, many years ago, like decades ago, not, not even when we did this. And um, I, I, long ago, I'd sort of had a real interest in certain strange kinds of exercises we do in the rehearsal room. In fact, I will show you one of those exercises now. Um, we sort of prepared this little thing earlier. Um, so uh, here is one of these exercises. <coughs> A round of applause, please, for our amazing performance. Um, so, <laughs> what you just saw probably seemed to be something that sort of made sense, right? It was a bit weird, but like it kind of made sense. It was a person interacting with a thing in a way that sort of made sense to you. But the thing is, um, it was created completely at random. Uh, I, I had a big long list of possible actions, and I, and, I, um, and I chose from them at random, and chose a random prop that would be the thing that was interacted with. And yet, it sort of kind of makes sense, right? So we would do this quite often in the rehearsal room. And I thought, that's really interesting. Maybe we can make longer and longer plays this way. So I tried to build a machine to do it. Uh, but I have none of Ross's skills, and so my machine was that thing. Uh, I rolled dice repeatedly uh, in order to make these longer and longer lists, and I, and I put it on stage, and audiences watched it, and I didn't tell, it where, tell them where it came from. And they thought, 
it was quite pretentious, but that it was, but that it was pretentious in a way that like, a, a pretentious human being had written it, right, rather than a, a, a machine um, in this case. But I, I thought that was exciting, but the problem was the dialogue. Uh, I tried to create dialogue the same way, and this is what dice-based dialogue sounds like. Titus Brentwood headsail Mexicano unmoving theologies, sensationalized shareable gerium, unstringing assassinus. Not good enough, right? So I needed, I needed like a rule system. I needed somebody to help me, somebody who was better at making machines. And every time I met someone like someone in this room, anyone who was like, oh, I can program an engineer, I would grab them by the lapels and go, I need to make systematized machine dialogue. Can you help me? And they would run from the building. And it would be, <laughs> it would be quite bad. But then for, for, for years, I try and do this. I don't get anywhere. Then I sort of become a filmmaker, and I get a Fulbright. Thank you for paying your taxes. You brought me to your country. And I, and I come to NYU Graduate Film. And um, it's on the 10th floor of the NYU Film building, which is a, the Tisch building, but on the fourth floor, where I accidentally got, got off one day, I saw this place, which is called ITP, which stands for what, it's Ross? It's the uh, Interactive Telecommunications Program, which is a bit of a dated title, but it's basically like art school for engineers or uh, engineering school for artists. So it's this place that's full of all these kind of mad scientist people who are building floating robot jellyfish and entire walls of animatronic penises. I am not joking, that is something that I saw there. And I thought, wow, this is a cool place. Maybe this is where I'll find the person I want to work with. So for ages, uh, I, I, like, it, it, I think it took two and a half years for me to finally get into yeah. a class at ITP, but I do. It's called Surveillance Documentary, and I meet Ross Bloody Goodwin. Sorry, just Ross Goodwin. <laughs> Ross Bloody Goodwin to his friends. Um, and, and immediately I discover that he is working with, what do you call it, natural? Natural language processing and natural language generation, which are words that probably make sense to most of the folks in this audience, but working with uh, spoken or written language, not computer code, uh, using computer code. And, and why were you doing that? What was the... Well, it's kind of a long trajectory like yours. So. Um, I used to be a political ghostwriter, if you can believe that. Um, this is me uh, about seven years ago. Um, and uh, my first job after college was at the White House as a ghostwriter for Barack Obama. Um, I started out writing letters on the 2008 presidential campaign. And at the White House, I wrote presidential proclamations, very glamorous job. Uh, these are like statements of national days, weeks, and months of things. So everything from Thanksgiving to uh, you know, African American History Month to uh, lesser known observances like Safe Boating Week. Um, very exciting <laughs> work. Uh, Did you ever write any of the speeches when, like, the end of the presidency or any of those? Not yet, no. we could maybe generate one of those with, with, with our machine? Yeah, maybe someday. Yeah, we should do that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, carry on. Um, anyway, uh, a few years later, I had left the government and I was working as a freelance ghostwriter, which is a miserable profession. Um, I wrote letters for uh, all sorts of clients, including a copper mining company. Uh, writing letters to government officials, ostensibly from concerned members of the local community, but actually all from me, saying things like, we want this mine. Your government red tape, meaning safety inspections, is killing jobs. And I did it because I needed the money, and it paid well because I found a way to cheat. So I used this technique that I called horizontal writing, and I didn't know how to code at all at this point. Um, I'd write all the first paragraphs, then all the second paragraphs, uh, and so on in a spreadsheet, and then copy the columns into Word docs, and then every other day, I'd run a simple Excel macro to randomly rearrange the cells, and then edit those and hand it in as a new batch of letters. So that allowed me to take an eight-hour-a-day job and turn it into a two-hour-a-day job. And I spent the rest of my time working on a novel that's still not finished, but that's a story for another time. Um, with some friends, I turned this horizontal writing into a collaborative fiction writing game that we called the diagonalization argument. And if you get that reference, you are a huge nerd. Hey, Ross, Ross, Ross. Uh, I can tour get your reference. <laughs> I had to um, Google that before. OK, I'm just going to ignore that. Uh, I, I don't have time to explain the complete rules of the game, but the gist of it is that each player gets a set of diagonals, and they can only fill in cells adjacent to cells that have already been filled. So uh, as a result, you build this collaborative novel. It's kind of like uh, a multiplayer exquisite corpse game, uh, uh, except for you know, spatially configured in this spreadsheet. Um, I didn't realize it when I was doing this, but uh, I, I thought I was onto something really new 
Uh, but lots of other folks have done the same thing in the past, mixing writing and algorithms. Um, this is Raymond Canu's 100,000 Billion Poems, written in 1961, and it's designed to be rearranged. Uh, Canu was part of ULIPO, the Ouvroir de Literature Potentielle, or the Workshop for Potential Literature. Um, and that's a group that continues to explore the intersection of literature and computation uh, today. And it's just one of many examples of, of folks who have, who have done this sort of work in the past. Um, but back to ITP. So yeah, like I finally found him. I found my dialogue person that can yeah. do natural language processing. So grab him by the lapels and like, can we make a screenplay with this stuff? And I said yes, because at this point I had been experimenting with things like Markov chains and context-free grammars and uh, template systems and all sorts of fun natural language generation uh, algorithms and tools. Well, of course, we had the issue that you know before my lists of actions uh, work for theatre, but they don't really work for film. So I'm like, well, we need to do something with visuals, Ross, like we need to have, uh, and so we start talking about the rules of screenplay, and in screenplay there is an um, action description and there's dialogue, there's the only two things, and in the action description it tells you what you can see, basically. Yeah, yeah, so I thought about, thought very hard about how to generate like a realistically descriptive action sequence, and it occurred to me that a good place to start might be with a photo. So uh, last year, early last year, I made, I made this web app called Word.Camera. Uh, it turns images into strange prose poems. Uh, it uses the Clarify API, the ConceptNet database, and a template system. And it's really about redefining the photographic experience. Um, but really, I made it because I was thinking about, you know, like I said, how screenplays are written, only things that can, seen can be described. And uh, you know, starting with a photo seemed like the right place to go. So this is what the output tended to look like. Um, this is a young photo of Vladimir Putin. Um, and uh, we have, meanwhile, a history, a group, and an outfit. Undoubtedly, the history may repeat itself. The group may reach agreement to be cooperative, and the outfit is a set of clothing. Whenever the history is for remember past, to sum up, it evokes narrate. Also, it evokes where they're going in. Following, it evokes famous figures. So it's a little choppy, but it is descriptive. And uh, it's basically taking words that it's extracting from the image, and then expanding that set of words into a set of sentences and paragraphs by referencing related words in a database. So um, I decided to make a physical device uh, out of this. Um, and again, it's about redefining the photographic experience, so that was sort of my tact at the time. So I used a thermal receipt printer to output the text so that it would be like a Polaroid. And I built them inside of old cameras because I wanted to provide a reference that users would immediately understand. And I wanted to also communicate this is a primitive form of something that I felt like had rich artistic potential. So there's a single button interface on the back. It's just a, uh, it's a Raspberry Pi with a camera module inside of a uh, uh, medium format TLR film camera. Um, and this is what the output looked like. Uh, at the top, there was, this is on the right, the left is just a Polaroid. Uh, on the top, uh, some generated text, like what you saw before. And then on the bottom, uh, a passage from a novel uh, from an onboard database that was algorithmically matched to the generated text so that you get like a passage that relates to the photo. So picture, if you can, that I still have my, uh, my uh, hands around Ross's lapels. And I'm like, hooray, we're going to have a screenwriting machine. And then he builds a camera that writes weird poems. Um, which isn't exactly a screenwriting machine. And then we try and do dialogue. Remember the thing that I wanted more than anything else? And it turns out that Markov chain dialogue sounds like this. Ladies and gentlemen, from Sofa, she made to be ruthlessly around explaining mist, up ahead of the few cows and get me too. Rene Beth Apostol, everyone, <laughs> coping beautifully with Markov chain dialogue. Um, so basically, it hadn't really worked. Uh, I was very impressed with everything that, that, that Ross had done. It was, it was mind blowing, but it wasn't really a screenplay generator, so I was a bit sad. Um, at which point, my life slightly exploded. I had a, a short film called The Carmen Line, which uh, you can look up on The New Yorker. It's still there if you'd like to watch it. Um, and they picked it up, and then it was, uh, won a load of prizes, got nominated for a BAFTA. Um, and then after the BAFTA nomination, I get this phone call from the former Spider Man, Tobey Maguire, who calls me up and goes, Hey, do you want to write a science fiction? <laughs> That's the picture you chose, is it? <laughs> okay. You know he's my boss, right? Really? Yeah, this might be on the internet. You report to him? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> anyway, so he's like, do you want to write a science fiction screenplay for your first feature film? I'm like, yes, that sounds really fun, having never done it before. And I ship off to Hollywood to start trying to write my first science fiction screenplay. We 
which turns out to be incredibly hard. But while I am doing that, Ross has made a discovery. Yes, um, and that is uh, the LSTM recurrent neural networks that we use to generate the screenplay for Sunspring. But uh, I started out, um, you know, I, I like I said uh, with the first version of Word Camera, using like APIs and uh, just uh, pre-built solutions. Uh, but uh, in December of last year, NYU gave me access to their high-performance computing facilities. So I was able to start training uh, my own uh, neural nets. And uh, I was really encouraged by the early results from that. On the left, there's uh, some uh, image captioning, uh, image captions, sorry, uh, which uh, are, are created using a convolutional neural net and an LSTM in tandem. And then on the right, we have some poetry that was generated from a large poetry corpus or a large collection of poetry text. Um, and I was really encouraged by these early results, and I, I, I kept going. And uh, you know, th this text doesn't just appear by itself; it has to be seeded. Um, or, uh, in, in other words, it has to uh, be uh, preceded by a, a phrase or, or a word or even just a letter um, that, that, that the computer then completes. So, you know, if you have the meaning of life is, the computer completes it as the meaning of life is a perfect vision of the proper form. The concept of poetry referring to the result of the possession of life and strength and pride and so on. Um, so that seeding technique uh, you know, uh, or, or that, 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 that seeding, uh, uh, you know, really, I, I, I was trying to find ways to play with that. And I made this bot called Lexiconjure. Uh, it's a Twitter bot. And I, I made it by training an LSTM on the Oxford English Dictionary. And uh, by seeding it with uh, a, a word and then a special character and then the word and then a special character, um, you can then generate uh, a plausible definition for a made up word or a plausible definition for a real word, depending on what you want to do. But if you tweet at Lexiconjure and then a made up word, uh, you will uh, receive a definition. You can go to lexiconjure.tumblr.com for the full definition. But uh, my favorite definition this had come up with was uh, the definition for love, which is a result of a person's or animal's response to a problem or difficulty. She loved the music of the new employee. Um, another version of this model also said the definition for love was past tense of leave, so that was pretty amusing. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to make, you know, the other thing I made was a new version of Word Camera. Um, by using those image captions to seed a poetic language LSTM, I was able to create, uh, you know, more coherent text, a little bit more poetic uh, from images. Uh, and uh, that's on my GitHub. It's called Neural Snap. Um, and so while working on that, uh, I, I wanted to make a new physical device and uh, a documentation video for that physical device. So I sent a poem to Oscar, because Oscar has a wonderful voice. So there I, I am recorded for voice languishing, over. languishing in Los Angeles, struggling desperately to write my first science fiction screenplay, wishing desperately that I had a machine to do it for me, and feeling a bit sad. And I realized that it was the build up to my, it was my birthday, and my birthday falls every year around the same time as the London sci-fi film festival short film challenge, right? So they do this 48-hour film challenge. They give you 48 hours to, they give you a, a line of dialogue and a title and a prop. You saw this at the beginning. And exactly 40 hours later, you upload a movie that you have written, shot, and cut in that time, which is tricky, but kind of reboots your excitement for the world. And I'm sort of thinking about this, wondering what I'm going to do for it, wishing that I had a machine to write the screenplays. And I get this email from Ross with a poem in it. Now, as you know from earlier on in the story, I've seen Ross's machine-generated poems before, and I have a slightly bitter memories about them. Um, but I'm like, oh, well, I'll read it. You know, I'll record it for him. Why not? Let me cue the uh, video for the... Let's get the video up here. Yeah, yeah, please. So he wants me to record this over the top of this, and it goes like this. <clears throat> a close-up of a clock on a wall of four o'clock in the morning. I am not so strange and will not delay. The room is blown away from the door, and the stones are beginning to shine. So the thing is, right, this was better than the previous poems he had sent me. It's still a bit weird, but it's like not word salad weird Markov chain nonsense like he'd been making before, in my opinion. So I'm like, this is strange. I'm experiencing emotions. I can't believe it. So I phone him excitedly and go, Ross, Ross, I'm experiencing emotions. You've made something emotional. Um, what can we do? Maybe I should perform this on stage. No, wait. Maybe we should get access to perform it. No, wait. Hang on. If we can make emotional poetry, can we make emotional dialogue? And I said, yes, absolutely. So uh, I got the Cornell Movie Scripts Corpus and uh, trained on 
raw dialogue. And the fun thing about that is when you train on dialogue, you can actually ask the model questions and receive answers. But so, so, we, yeah, so we now he's spitting out dialogue for me. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, great, this is good. Let's have a look at this dialogue stuff. And it's the stuff that you heard at the beginning that Sophia so beautifully performed. That's from that model. And it was cool, but the problem is it just went on and on and on and on and on and on. It was one person talking infinitely. Uh, and this was a bit of an issue because that's not what a screenplay looks like. So I go, Ross, Ross, I think we could use this for this film competition, but can you make it look more like a screenplay? Can it have descri action description? Can the dialogue be of a normal length? So I took a very uh, obtuse route to create that. I just used screenplays. Yeah, not very obtuse at all. <laughs> um, used a, a, a bunch of screenplays rather than raw dialogue, um, about 170 movies, all science fiction, and about uh, five complete TV shows, including like the original Star Trek and uh, Stargate SG-1 and a bunch of uh, older stuff. And uh, the cool thing is that the LSTM can actually replicate the formatting of the screenplays. So it was able to work out where the action description was and what the dialogue was, and it would have character names, kind of. We ran into a bit of speed bump with the, with the character names, right? Yeah, yeah. The character names are, are tricky because um, proper names, LSTMs have a lot of trouble with them because if you think about it, a proper name is a word that can occur in the same context in two completely different sentences, or sorry, two identical sentences sentences, other than the word being different. Uh, and an LSTM only understands character-to-character uh, -character sequences. So uh, to see two completely different words in the same context is very, I guess, confusing for the machine. Um, so there's a couple solutions that I found to this problem, one of which was to reduce the sort of namespace of the uh, corpus by uh, taking the large set of names and then you know, uh, regular expression replacing them with a relatively smaller set of names. What we did for Sunspring was just replace those names with the first letter of each name. So, it happened. He finally had a machine that could write screenplays. So we decided we're going to do it. We gather everyone together on, the, on, on this particular day, my birthday as it happens. We have our 48-hour clock begin. I've got this one thing generated by, uh, by, the, by the machine, which, by the way, at the time was called Jetson, not Benjamin. You'll find out why a bit later. And so Jetson has spelled out the screenplay, and I gather together all the actors and the crew, and I, and I didn't want to interpret it beforehand. I put everyone in one room, and I gave the actors the thing, and they read it. At, and basically, I want you to see just how cool that was the first time we did it, because this is what it's all about, the fact that it was finally something an actor could make sense of. So we are going to do that today in the same way with our two glorious actors here. Ross, I would like you to generate a brand new piece of dialogue for us. So let's uh, welcome our actors to the middle of the stage. <laughs> they, they are going to cold read for you, just as our cast did that day, uh, exactly what Benjamin decides to generate. So um, while he's printing this out mm -hmm. uh, and generating a new script, what's it like performing the material written by a computer? Um, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> you, have to find, um, you have to find the meaning in it. Uh -huh. You have to find the meaning in the individual words and in the individual sentences mm. and worry less about the, the journey if I you're see. learning it like Cold. How is that different from when you, when you were learning it? How is it different from working right. with the stuff? So, if you, so when I'm doing a play or doing anything else, like you generally have like a whole script and an arc, and you can kind of tell in the beginning like what the feel of this character is, like what their voice is like compared to what this other voice is like. But with this, it was like, who, what is this voice? And you just kind of have to put your experience and everything else kind of on top of it rather than it being kind of generated from the Well, world. you're about to do that interpretation again. <laughs> <laughs> let's give you one of each. Um, let's assign roles. I guess, uh, I guess you'll speak first, let's say. You can be, the character is called A and okay. D. A and, and D, 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 D are, uh, okay. are, are here. Um, and let's give you a little situation. <coughs> How about um, you're waiting, okay. uh, and you're waiting and waiting, and you're waiting for her to come home, and finally she comes home. I have no idea what this script is like. I just think that might help them. Let's find out. Uh, and uh, quiet around, please. Roll camera. Action. A woman who should be here in that house. I can remember that more than I do. What are you talking about? You don't have to do this. So you got a little more important to get to see me again? I'm not sure. You know, when they arrive, you're the only one who can defend you. Look, I have no idea. I have to tell you that I was from the other side. I thought you didn't come here to do that. 
I, I don't think so. I, I was not one of you. You said you were going to be a man. I don't believe you. I don't want you to hurt me again. My name is R2. I am not going to tell you this. Like anything you want to do, I can be the first to hear you. I don't know what to say. I don't want you to show me how you want to save me. I'm not sure what you want. The truth is, I have to say that. I think I'm going to stand by the chair before I can get this back. I'm taking this ship out of my head. How could you do that? I'm not sure I can. Well, I'm not sure what the hell I can do. Yes. I'm telling you the truth. I think you should talk to me about the ship. I know. I'm sorry. I will always be here to tell you how much faith it is. I don't think there are any time that you will be looking for me. Yes. I will not ask you to return to the bridge. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Sophia and Rinabe. Thank you. Think about it. <laughs> so uh, let's see what the interface looks like for that experiment. Fantastic. Uh, this is Benjamin. Um, and uh, the cool thing about this interface is that you can, like, this is what we just generated. You can type stuff. Uh, like, uh, should we show them the title generator? Oh, and the title generator. So we need yeah. a title for that movie, right? Like this incredible film about sex changes on a spaceship? Something like that? Uh, it's definitely called Ranch Boy the Next Generation. Of course it is. <laughs> Ranch Boy the Next Generation. That is, uh, that is perfect. Um, Hollywood Street. This is, so th these are, these are uh, the corpus, the input corpus for this are all of the movie titles we could find. Um, and I find this an incredibly useful tool as a filmmaker. Um, we also, we tried a few other things. We trained on uh, every movie synopsis that we could get our hands on. Um, why yeah, don't we yeah. knock out one of those? Sure, um, sure. So movie synopses, like, is this going to help me have good ideas for films? Let's find out, shall we? Yeah, yeah. So let's see. Once upon a time, the streets, streets in the city, in the city are forced to confront the struggle to control the, the, the dead. dead. <laughs> Peter is a young man. He was having a hard time. So it's, it's interesting. Um, forced to confront is probably the most common word in any uh, phrase in any movie synopsis. Young man is probably the second most common. Uh, actually, we ran a, a concordance on uh, hundreds and hundreds of these, and we found out that men are mentioned four times more often than women, um, and that a small town is definitely the most common place that movies are set. So this has been uh, an incredible ride for us. We've got like a couple of minutes left, so we kind of should wrap things up here. Um, we, we entered the contest uh, with, the, with, this, um, with this film. Uh, it was shortlisted uh, among the top 10. Um, we noticed that a couple of the other contestants in the online poll were cheating. They were click farming. Um, and we were annoyed about that. And so our machine. Can we go uh, back to the slides, please? Let's go back to the slides. Our machine, uh, Jetson, uh, as it was called at the time, was employed to uh, vote against them 36,000 times an hour. And. <laughs> Constantly uh, and consequently, we, we crushed them. But we phoned the, the people who ran the contest the next morning and went, oh my god, our machine went rogue. We're so sorry. Um, we didn't mean for this to happen. And they thought it was hilarious. So they decided to interview him live on stage. Um, and this was the last question they asked. <laughs> he says with 90 seconds to go. And our yeah, yeah. is quite good. Have you got your clicker ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like I said, you may have been wondering how it is that it came to be called Benjamin, right? So um, it runs on a piece of software called Jet, uh, a piece of hardware called the NVIDIA Jetson. We'd been nicknaming it Jetson. But they asked it, what's next for you? And Jetson, as it was called then, replied, here we go. The staff is divided by the train of the burning machine building with sweat. No one will see your face. The children reach into the furnace, but the light is still slipping to the floor. The world is still embarrassed. The party is with your staff. My name is Benjamin.
So just back to the film for a second. I really love this scene. The, the line from the screenplay, and if you don't know, we generated the action descriptions as well as the dialogue, obviously. The line from the screenplay was he pulls his eyes from his mouth. And I think this really shows the potential of uh, a uh, learning machine for creating rich, provocative, abstract imagery. But uh, this scene you know, I like a little bit more. Um, uh, the line is he pulls the camera toward his back, he is on the phone, but then the angle changes and he's holding nothing. And the first part was machine dictated, the second part was human interpretation that was informed by years of, of Oscar's filmmaking experience. And I think that cycle of generation and interpretation is what demonstrates the true augmentative capacity of these learning machines and how they can help us tell new types of stories that we've never seen or heard before. And that's really the point for, for both of us, is I love the idea of these collaborations as much as I love collaborating with actors, I love collaborating with all of my collaborators on every film set, because directors don't do anything. They're like crowd surfing sloths. Everyone else does all of the work. But, but now I have a new, a new member in my crowd. I have this incredible machine, which it's not the machine, it's the corpus. It's, it's the, the input. I can have all of my favorite rom-com writers help me with the rom-com I'm writing. I can have um, all of my favorite cinematographers as we build Benjamin out help me choose my shots, help me, the designers help me, help me design the colors and, and, and so on. And this is a completely fascinating thing for me and it means that between us, we're hoping to move the form forward. So, um, you know, if any of you guys have any ways of helping us, uh, please come and have a chat. Um, we'll be around, uh, Ross will be around more than me. Um, but uh, that is the plan um, and thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.